Science Uncut, presented by the Volkswagen Foundation. Never before have there been as many pictures and images as today. We document our lives at every opportunity. Snapshots of the children playing in the backyard, a quick picture of my friend and me sipping a coffee in a Berlin cafe, the gorgeous view from our hotel window. We take these pictures so that we can remember. We use them to tell small stories and to assure ourselves of who we are and what kind of life we are living. So far, so good. This seems simple enough. The question is how to deal with the flood of images we produce. How do we store and organize them? This is a problem that becomes even bigger if we look not only at our personal collections of images, but when we start to think about our collective memories as a society. Digital technology leads to an explosion of images, texts, and audios. Every two minutes, we take as many photographs as during the entire 19th century. Jeffrey Schnapp is professor of Romance Languages and Literature and teaches on the faculty of the Department of Architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. He is also the founder of MetaLab, a research project on Internet culture in the arts and humanities. His talk has the title Knowledge Design. In it, Jeffrey Schnapp lays out the many possibilities created by our current flood of data. He explains how libraries are changing and how museums are suddenly able to tell stories that couldn't be told before. The question we should be thinking about is, how can we give these data a culturally meaningful form? Jeffrey Schnapp gave his talk on December 5th, 2013, at the Herrenhäuser Conference of the Volkswagen Foundation in Hannover, Germany. The conference had the title Digital Humanities Revisited – Challenges and Opportunities in the Digital Age. Much of what I'm going to do is uh, to formulate a series of, uh, of questions. Now, the phrase knowledge design describes the situation in the contemporary humanities that most closely engages my own work as both an analog and a digital humanist. I was actually a uh, medievalist by training uh, with a particularly strong interest in manuscript culture. And which is to say, the setting is a setting in which neither the form and the genre contours that humanistic knowledge assumes, nor the methods that produce such knowledge can be considered as givens. The tools of humanistic inquiry have become as much objects of experimentation and research as have their modes of dissemination. Statistical methods press up against one edge of the qualitative human sciences. Graphic and information design press up against another. Laboratories arise with a team-based ethos embracing a triangulation of arts practice, critique, and outreach, merging research, pedagogy, publication, and practice. The once firm boundary between libraries, museums, archives, and the classroom grow porous as scholarship, deprived of its once exclusive print-based home, shuttles back and forth between pixels and the page, the stacks and the streets. Micro and macro forms of inquiry flourish side by side, giving rise to new challenges. How to construct arguments that zoom back and forth between the micro and the macro scale perhaps even overleaping those middle layers of analysis and narrative that once constituted the home turf of the arts and humanities disciplines. How to weave together forms of visual and verbal, and why not tactile and olfactory uh, evidence. How to chunk information in a world that demands short as well as long forms, and where iterative and multi-channel publishing is increasingly the norm. Does this experimental turn, as some still argue, mark an eclipse of humanistic learning, a definitive crisis to be added to at least a half century of premonitory crises? On the contrary, I'm more inclined to see it as an opportunity of unique scope and potential for renewal, an occasion to remap fields of inquiry and knowledge, and why not the arts and humanities included, and to increase their rigor and social impact to reposition them with respect to contemporary society, to expand the audience for advanced cultural and knowledge forms, and therefore to further long-term processes of cultural democratization that remain one of the great legacies of the 19th and the 20th centuries. <laughs> 
so th this talk is going to be built less around answers to some of the questions that I just posed than it is around models and hypotheses. And it will raise plenty of additional questions along the way. At core, it will provide a selective sketch of the overall setting uh, just evoked, and in so doing, single out some nodes that I consider of special interest with respect to the future of humanistic inquiry. And for uh, present purposes, and for purposes of brevity, I'm going to call these storied collections, by which I mean innovative things we can do with and across collections, uh, particularly as aggregates, as large aggregates, but also as sub-aggregates. The second is the social life of things, um, namely new approaches, innovative approaches to description of three-dimensional objects, of object-based collections, and how we can imagine the transfer of them into screen environments and back into the physical environment. Third, new learning containers, namely some, I think, rethinking that's going on not just in my environment, but I think worldwide, about learning spaces and models of learning in the digital era. It's a, a conversation that has implications for knowledge forms as well. And fourth, what I'm going to call ubiquitous curation, which is the world as a wide, an open-air classroom and laboratory, whether it's networks in natures or networks and cities. So question, do all neatly fall under the wing of the so-called digital humanities? Well, yes and no. Yes, to the degree that digital humanities is an even more capacious umbrella than the labels like computational humanities or humanities computing, or there were a number of other ones that preceded it. It's less a field than an assemblage of sometimes concordant, sometimes discordant experimental practices. Yes, also to the degree that the words digital, yes, also to the degree that all the practices in question uh, that are covered by these umbrella terms involve intensive work with the cultural record in the sort of historically and critically informed fashion that has been fundamental to the humanistic disciplines over the course of their modern history. But no, to the degree that the words digital and humanities have spongy edges. All four of my nodes, that is, spill out into domains of contemporary culture and society that aren't under the exclusive ownership of any given constellation of disciplines and techniques. And then, of course, there's the deeper sponginess of the digital itself. The digital is ultimately not about the digital. Rather, it's about new ways of engaging and interacting with the world. It's about extending our cognitive faculties and social existences, new ways to analyze and experience the past and the present, new ways to work, think, share, and enjoy. In short, it's about work and science, yes, but also about the stuff of culture, including dreams, imaginings, and stories. Institutions of memory like museums, libraries, and archives, are very good at accumulating, inventorying, sorting, and storing the sorts of materials that make up the cultural record. But they sometimes struggle to make those materials accessible, to bring them to life, and to make them matter, whether to research communities or to the general public. Most estimates on the portion of cultural collections ever exposed to the public run in the 5 to 15% range. It's probably an overly generous estimate. The rest is locked up in storage so deep as to be inaccessible to even in-house personnel in many major institutions. To a significant degree, as you can well imagine, this is due to problems of quantity and scale that are conventionally addressed by means of extreme selectivity. Collecting practices have been radically democratized and diversified over the course of the past century. We now collect and preserve more types, categories, and quantities of materials than ever in the history of humankind. And these materials tell a vastly expanded range of stories about historical moments, people, places, and things. But only a finite number of such stories can be documented and told when the documenting and telling happens in a finite number of spaces with properly restrictive rules of access and complex sets of security, climate control, lighting equipment requirements, and so forth, all of which, of course, need, needless to say, entail very substantial costs, as well as governance and management issues. The problem, of course, isn't just space and resources, and the solution isn't just digitizing everything. 
because without platforms that facilitate rich modes of interaction, digitization alone amounts to little more than a baby step in the direction of activating the potential knowledge found in that 85 to 95 percent that's locked up in deep storage. The greater problem is one of growing quantities as well as redundancies. Let's take the example of photographic archives, which is one that's particularly dear to my heart. It would be hard to dispute the fact that photography has become one of the defining forms of cultural memory, whose significance has continued to expand over the course of the past century. As photography has moved from craft to profession to ever-present feature of everyday life, the result is captured by factoids like the following. It has been estimated that every two minutes we now take as many photographs as were taken during the entire 19th century. Even before the advent of digital photography or camera-equipped smartphones, collecting institutions were overwhelmed by the sheer volume of photographic documents. Uh, the Library of Congress, for instance, holds something like 14 million analog photographs, paper photographs. And, of course, that collection alone is hundreds of times more than any, even the most generous processing budget will ever allow for. Yet Facebook houses a photographic repository 10,000 times larger, 10,000 times 14 million. Flickr hosts another 7 billion digital photographs. And during the unfolding of the sentence that I'm reading to you, another 20,000 uploads have happened via Instagram. This is the sea within which our digitized cultural collections must swim. And it's a sea saturated with not just with photographic, but also with graphic, typographic, video, acoustical, and textual plankton. The question is not, and has never been, that of pursuing hazy ideals of total preservation. Even at the end of the 18th century, total preservation was at best a convenient fiction. But how do we make the corpora that matter to a given community or within a given cultural domain accessible and usable in meaningful ways, particularly as collections migrate out of deep storage into massive inventories that are accessible online? And I think the whole early history of major digitization efforts has shown us over and over again that digitization in itself doesn't really accomplish anything fundamentally, fundamentally with respect to access. There's something more needed. I think that more, that the answer, lies less on the storage and preservation side than on the user activation side of the divide. Past, present, and future collections will live or die, come into being or cease to be, as a function of the communities that animate them by means of operations of processing, analysis, interpretation, argumentation, remixing, in short, thanks to active use and reuse. And the cognitive scale on which such operations have traditionally been carried out was, of course, that of scanning a small repository or a collection, culling from the scanning process an even smaller subset of records or materials that then becomes the object of intensive analysis and interpretation, yielding a narrative, a critical argument, whether on the page or in space in the case of curatorial practice, then weaves together meanings in typically the lower to middle zone between the micro and macro perspectives, the individual artifact and the world of objects to which that object, that artifact belongs. Hundreds of years of tradition have gone into shaping the rules for such models of cultural argument and the analytical procedures that support them. Cultural history's home has long been somewhere in this small to middle zone. But what happens when we move from big to titanic collections, from tens or hundreds of cultural objects to tens or hundreds of thousands and beyond into the millions and billions? How do we navigate, describe, analyze, interpret, and tell stories with, about, and through such enormous aggregates? Collections tell big and significant stories that are fundamental to every field of cultural history. But cognitively speaking, humans are far better at grappling with small rather than large sets of objects. And here, our traditions, not to mention our concepts of genre, methodology, evidence, and argument, run the risk of failing. And it is here that our imagination as knowledge designers is summoned into action. The challenge posed is multifaceted. 
It involves new kinds of engagement with the data that accompany cultural objects and collections, and that typically means inventory systems of one kind or another, and their transformation into such representations, not only, but in particular, as visualizations. But visualizations are a craft, not a science. And data themselves are not facts, but rather artful constructs that express hierarchies and values, institutional norms and contradictions. So what is an effective, significant, or memorable data visualization? How to toggle between such aggregate forms of representation, the analysis and experience of large data aggregates, and the intimate experience of individual cultural objects in all of their particulars? And how do we make arguments, culturally meaningful and memorable arguments, that productively zoom back and forth between the one and the other? This is not a challenge unique to the humanities disciplines, but it is distinctive inasmuch as criticality and attention to the qualitative have long been the core humanistic values. Recent work in my colleague Hans-Peter Pfister's research group at Harvard has suggested just how ineffective, uh, at least from the standpoint of memorability, are traditional data display formats, such as bar, pie, and scatter charts, noting the superior power of visualizations that incorporate faces and human-centric scenes, particularly when embedded within stories. But though the study found that tree diagrams, network diagrams, and grid matrices were somewhat better, they remain imperfect, and they're certainly far from universally applicable tools to be used in every single task. So the question arises, what is the right tool for a given navigational analytical or interpretive task? How do we weave outputs crafted with, with such tools into forms of argument and embed uh, and, and narration also that signify culturally, that tell stories of consequence? How do we effectively embed human faces into trees, matrices, and networks? And what sorts of distinctive new types of stories do collections want to tell that they have been unable to tell with prior methodologies, with prior toolkits? Herein resides the challenge that I'm referring to as storied collections and that I'm associating here with the need to give rise to a humanistic culture of critical engagement with data and data architectures themselves, as well as with the tools that analyze and translate them into argumentative forms. And in this domain, I've long followed with interest an array of experiments from emerging, uh, this has been a, a kind of cultural historical interest of my, mine, emerging canons for the representation of human multitudes uh, as the protagonists of modern life via the techniques of uh, panoramic photography to much more recently projects like Microsoft Research's uh, photo tourism project to Nadav Hoffman, Liv Manovich, and Jay Chow's fantastic work on photo trails, which I think will be familiar to uh, many of you. Um, and I've also been inspired in this regard by large-scale collaborative data-driven art practices They've really been a pretty constant source of um, inspiration. Um, and I would include in those certainly the Sensible City Labs New York Talk Exchange, a lot of the work that um, Aaron Koblen has done in particular. Some examples are the – one nice example is the Johnny Cash Project. And my colleague Bobby Petrusco's 2011 The Accelerated Art World uh, installation, 2009, which was installed at the ZKM. Now, in a related vein, but with certainly with divergent uh, aims, MetaLab is in the process of rolling out a platform known as Curarium. The name Curarium, or place of curation, is directly inspired on the name Vivarium, or place of life, with which Cassiodorus in the 6th century named his uh, monastic community in Calabria. And Curarium's mission is to allow a diverse community of users from scholars, curators, and museum professionals to teachers and students and to members of the general public to see and work not just with individual items as they come online, but with collections as aggregates, even as massive aggregates, and to do things with those collections at and across the strata that run back and forth between individual objects and collections as wholes. The doing in question involves annotation, teaching, and research, uh, the making of collections out of collections, and even the collective sourcing of unprocessed or difficult-to-process collections. 
In the case of collections that have already been described and inventoried, Curarium is designed to allow for the easy ingestion of uh, collections data within a flexible setting that allows for a range of navigation, analysis, processing, researching, uh, research, teaching, annotation, and publication activities. All media content is linked to externally, so collections themselves are not hosted within Curarium. And what you're seeing here is the process of ingestion of a collection, uh, its configuration and ingestion. Only cataloging data is ingested that is otherwise inaccessible to researchers or locked up in proprietary um, inventory systems like uh, TMS. The only requirement for record ingestion is that the data is presented as valid JSON with a consistent hierarchy throughout the collection since the configuration tool, as you're seeing right here, allows arbitrarily nested structures to be mapped to a flattened key value representation with the keys being fields like title, date, subject, author, um, et cetera, et cetera. And since no single structure is specified, any and all source formats can be converted to JSON and then ingested. And it's important to note that the only fields that are required are, are title and author. Everything else is completely usable. And on the basis of these fields, representations of everything from entire collections and even collections of collections to filtered subcollections can be generated on the fly via a library of visualization tools that includes tag charts, tree diagrams, thumbnail arrays, uh, timelines, and so forth. And this library of forms is expansible, and the notion is that it would uh, grow over time, and it can be used for purposes of navigation sorting and subcollection building in a user's trays. But no less richly, it can also be used to expose the so-called data artifacts or anomalies that tell stories about the shifts and contradictions in the description and categorization of collections by host institution. This is a slide from a project that we did for the Digital Public Library of America, where, where once we started exposing aspects of the databases, what we saw were confusions that were categorical confusions that had happened in the course of the history of shifts in classification methods. Or similarly here, here's another visualization of the Di Digital Public Library of America in construction and you see that certain types have been described using language that creates overlaps, apparent distinctions that are actually descriptions of a single object, and so forth. Now, the point I want to make here is that the real novelty is less, is, it isn't the library of visualization tools, but rather the fact that visualization, visualizations generated within Curarium can be transformed into cultural objects in their own right, saved as part of the research and curation process and added to a user's tray, they're able to track back to the moment in a search process that they capture and therefore can be woven into curatorial arguments that assume the form here of what we're calling uh, spotlights. And an eventual aim will be to build bridges that allow for the export of trays and spotlights to other production environments like Omeka and um, the like. Uh, our test collection in Curarium is an art historical puzzle. Bernard Berenson's homeless paintings of the Italian Renaissance photo archive. It's not an art object archive, it's a photo archive. 17,000 vintage photographs of 11,000 art objects that once existed, because the photographs were taken at a time in the past, uh, but whose uh, present existence or location is unknown. Within months of the initial publication of the archive on the Harvard servers, an American student, uh, a freshman uh, in college, was able to identify and establish the location of 120 such works, mostly paintings from the circle of Jacopo de Celayo. Another 10,880 remain for the moment homeless, but perhaps not for long once uh, we roll out the beta version of Curarium in uh, the spring of 2014. But what interests us most is less whether every puzzle regarding an artwork's current location or survival can be solved, but whether we can forge new models of scholarly argument and storytelling where collections function as cultural artifacts in their own right, in dialogue with other collections, as well as with fam the families of objects of which they are composed. Thus far, I've focused on big data and the challenges of working data into culturally meaningful forms be they arguments, stories, portraits, or representations. Now I'd like to flip the question on its head, so to speak, 
and to turn to questions of capture, classification, and description at the level of the individual object. These are questions that particularly haunt me as a cultural historian interested in fields like the history of industrial design and material culture. Namely, how can we interact more effectively with three-dimensional objects in screen-based settings? The cultural record consists not just in documents, but in things, things whose meaning is reducible neither to text or nor two-dimensional photographs. The knowledge present in such artifacts is multisensory, tactile, olfactory, acoustical, spatial, as well as visual. We experience these things not by adopting a single fixed uh, perspective, but by moving in and around them, by assembling and disassembling, by using them as interfaces to explore the world. Many of the items in that dormant 85 to 95 percent of cultural materials in deep storage are 3D objects that translate poorly to the screen. The reduction of the materiality of a rare book to a resizable two-dimensional record strips away key information regarding its cultural and social meaning. But in the case of a 3D object, the stripping away process may be even more draconian still. How could such objects be better captured and described in screen environments? How might techniques and practices be developed that deepen, expand, and enrich our experience of objects rather than providing impoverished to digital, digital doubles? And what are the distinctive medium-specific affordances of these digital doubles? I think there are plausible answers to such questions. There are answers that involve both enhanced access as well as enhanced use value. But I don't think they're going to be provided by engineers. The problem isn't generating geometrically exact 3D scans of cultural objects. Technically speaking, that's a triviality. That problem was solved a long time ago. The problem is that such a scan is of limited significance if it reduces my object to a hollow shell stripped of most of its defining characteristics or creates a data object too heavy to be worked on or shared in a browser. The solution lies in exploring how and where value can be added rather than subtracted in the process of translation of physical object to screen and then from screen back to physical object. In other words, it's a knowledge design question. And in my view, it's one that requires an enriched set of models of capture and description, experimentation with alternate modes of navigating data associated with objects and their interrelations, what I'm going to refer to in a few minutes as the notion of the artifactual interface. And third, an approach to objects themselves that understands them not just as singular entities, but as networks of relations. Such, at least, is the approach that we've adopted. It's a project that's still very much in an early sketching stage, but it may be useful just to kind of flesh out a vision of what a world would look like where it was possible to work with cultural collections that are made up of three-dimensional objects as well as, rec as, as uh, textual records. So let's start with the problem of capture and description. In teaching with things, our point of departure was to en enrich the standard inventory or bibliographical records by adding two multimedia elements. An anchor representation in the form of a quick and dirty working 3D model produced either using photogrammetry or uh, these rather crude simplified scanning stations we came to call active Susans. An active Susan is the opposite of a lazy Susan, which is one of those kitchen cabinets, right? Um, and secondly, a library of video clips um, a library of video clips developed in the act of processing the object. The latter would typically include documentation of the object's scale and weight, its sound properties, its component parts, and any details that are significant from the standpoint of its use or meaning. These base elements are supplemented with forms of capture that expose otherwise imperceptible features, stuff you can't or couldn't even see if the object was sitting right in front of you. Uh, that could include high magnification views of surface attributes, maybe in places that are not visible in an object but that can be represented in other ways, uh, CT scans, anything that adds value to our understanding, our ability to engage at least in a screen environment with, uh, with an object. Um, in other words, here description and the building of a core record are viewed as an interpretive process that results in not a chunk of text accompanied by a photograph, but in a multimedia composite. There's an anchor model 
but it's little more than a working model. No one representation, whether text record or video clip or photograph or sound file, puts itself forward as the definitive portrait. Rather, each and every object is treated as a collective, uh, a collection, a kind of mosaic, an aggregate of uh, characteristics. So this is a picture of a social network of a thing. Step two in teaching with things is to transform this composite into a node that supports and sustains an array of interpretive activities from annotations and commentary to links across the collection and beyond via open APIs. Such annotations, whatever their medium, can be pinned to any location on the 3D anchor model or to the model as a whole. They can be displayed in one of two forms. The first is as a set of windows radiating outward from the model. The object serves as a kind of artifactual interface. Much as one explores an object in the physical world with one's hands, one is able to explore clusters of annotations without ever entering a keyword by simply rotating and zooming in and out of the anchor model. The second mode involves a split, a split screen representation in which the core record made up of an anchor model plus media, multimedia description elements appear on the left, while on the right appears the accumulated stratigraphy of forms of analysis, argument, and commentary that considered together tell the full but still unfolding story of a given object, its family relations, its meanings, as construed by varying communities of interpreters. The aim is to model a world where instead of being treated as solitary entities, cultural objects appear instead in the midst of the networks of interrelations that confer meaning upon them. It's a social network of things. And yes, things have friends, just like on Facebook. Such a thick approach to description implies an elevated degree of engagement with a limited set of objects. And in the case of teaching with things, our initial focus has been on collections-based teaching and on exhibitions as sites of scholarly practice. In the first case, this has implied the development of syllabi of things for the teaching of material um, culture uh, in particular. And in the second, <clears throat> as yet unrealized, the goal of integrating intensive, thick forms of digital curation into gallery installations. If the overall aim of, of teaching with things is to explore the networks of relations that animate a, a given cultural object in a digital environment, then the final destination is to place those networks in dialogue with the physical originals. The slide I've been showing you documents what Athenians called uh, I don't know if any classicists are here, an ostrachon. The um, ancient Greeks threw nothing away, and uh, when a pot broke, it became the equivalent of a post-it note. And such shards were inscribed with messages of all kinds. You're just seeing here the uh, extraordinary range of these, the numbers of them that make them up. And they tell, of course, a multitude of uh, stories. They're stories about the votes of banishment that they were used for, which is the source of our word ostracism. They tell stories about the pots that they came from. They tell stories about the, the migration, the assemblage of collections of ostraca and so forth. And uh, one of our objectives is to do, engage in one of these kinds of forms of curatorial, uh, rich, kind of dense curatorial description, and to be able to expose the buzz of conversation between domain experts flickering around the physical fragments in an actual museum environment, for example. We've talked about the stories that collections can tell, and we've talked about the minute, even microscopic world of things and its multifarious genealogies. Now let's turn to the question of what it means to inhabit a world that has been transfigured into a Wi-Fi hotspot. Only a decade ago, places of connectivity had to be sought out like island paradises, Today, the greater challenge is carving out cold spots in a hyperconnected world. I say this with only a modicum of irony, inasmuch as the question of how we design spaces for learning, spaces for data and media-rich knowledge production and reproduction, whether offline or online, is very much up for grabs. And I really don't see any reason why the digital humanities should not be part of this conversation. I began with the concept of the cold spot in as much as it was first formulated by a student in the library test kitchen design studio that my colleagues and I have been running at the Harvard Graduate School of Design since the fall of 2011. The cold spot is one contemporary way to pose the question, a question that reaches back to the foundations 
of the humanities, namely the notion that knowledge is produced and reproduced in places of solitary retreat and contemplation, spaces where one leaves behind the world of everyday distractions to enter a, into a deeper world of conversation with the spirits of the living and the dead. And for much of human history, such spaces of communion have been called libraries, and everything in them, from the architectural container to shelving systems, carols, and copy stations to the collections they contain, has been designed to support certain forms of atten attention, engagement, interaction, and creation. And surely much of this core mission of retreat remains pertinent in this world today, even as changes, conditions have fundamentally changed. So what happens to the library qua architectural container when I, carry, I can carry or access a library 1,000 times bigger than the entire library of Alexandria on the mobile device in my pocket? Or when modes of solitary inquiry find themselves increasingly flanked by nos noisy collaborative models, or when thinking is no longer segregated from physical making? And what about the library's contents? On the one hand, knowledge forms are migrating to digital platforms, where models of publication are by their very nature iterative. On the other, we are now printing more books than ever before in the history of printing itself. And indeed, what ought books to become in the digital age? Mere moments in iterative process or final products? What does knowledge look like on the printed page? I think these are all questions that are up for grabs today, and I'm not going to be able to linger on them, but here's one proposition for what uh, a scholarly argument might look like, uh, one of many. All of which brings me back to the question of cold spots. Just how cold do we want our cold spot to be? If reading and study signify engagements both with digital as well as print media, do we want to filter out all communications, only email and tweets? What about online databases? Do we really want to limit note-taking to analog note-taking? Such questions have a way of focusing our attention on what, in a sense, is one of the deepest design questions of our era. We live in an information-saturated world a world in which there's a great deal of talk about smart cities and smart spaces. And since the beginning of human history, libraries have been the smartest spaces of all. Yet just how smart are today's environments where the digital and the analog, the online and the offline commingle? I would generally say not terribly smart at all. This is a familiar location to all of us, and it's not a smart space by most definitions, I think. And this same question extends to the design of classrooms, to a whole range of other kinds of learning environments. And this has been the focus of a lot of the speculative work that Library Test Kitchen, at least, has been doing in a kind of propositional way to try to think about the building of knowledge spaces for uh, a future uh, where the, maybe the furnishings look fundamentally different, maybe the spaces of concentration look fundamentally different, maybe books send us messages when we uh, have ever searched for them before, uh, maybe a reference room is a place uh, of curation, uh, more like a gallery than like an information desk. But I, I don't have time to go into all of those particulars, but rather just to close with the question of curation. By way of conclusion, I'd li now, now like to take the notion of the world as hotspot a bit more literally in order to return to a question that lies at the heart of the present talk. Namely, how do we make data, big or small, matter? and matter not for purposes of targeted advertising or surveillance or predictive forecasting, but instead in substantive societal and cultural ways. Paradoxically, data today is so often so abundant as to render it of little impact or use, and it's a truism to observe that in and of itself, the, even the very best knowledge base doesn't necessarily alter behaviors or perceptions, not to mention affect social or cultural change. So how do we model and develop the tools, translational arts and techniques, the critical and curatorial practices, the modes of communication and participation that bring information to bear meaningfully on and in the world? This seems to me an eminently humanistic question, and it's one that takes on a dramatic coloration when it comes to matters such as climate change. And of course, it applies much more broadly to human interactions with the environment. Until recently, the natural world mostly fell outside the compass of data networks. Now, much of it no longer does. But how to leverage the powers of a networked nature in ways that promote and sustain a culture of engagement and shared guardianship of the landscape and the environment? 
That's the question. Let's take the example of urban parklands, frequented by significant portions of the population throughout the world. A majority of that visitor population, smartphone in pocket or tablet in bag, experiences these environments not as artificial constructs meticulously crafted and maintained like the galleries of a museum, but rather as natural landscapes, and understandably so. With the exception of themed formal gardens, signage is usually limited to metallic tags bearing the Latin names of trees, of significance mostly to professional botanists. There's little to suggest that there's a learning opportunity here, not to mention that your place of recreation is also an open-air classroom in the making. Everything says instead, this is a place of relaxation and recreation. Curiously enough, the relative scarcity of on-site didactic supports is inversely mirrored by the abundance of open science resources uh, on the World Wide Web regarding plants, landscapes, and environments. But it's not just a matter of building a bridge between the information, these rich information resources and the array of locations that make up an urban parkland. The deeper question is what kind of bridge? Following a standard top-down didactic model, it would be easy enough to envisage placement of QR codes on every tree and plant so as to supplement the experience of standing before a specimen with layer upon layer of information provided by experts. One could, of course, augment that experience further and so forth. But just how productively do people use QR codes? I would say not very in my experience. Moreover, however well designed and intended, how effective is it to load up visitors with the experience of information rather than letting them process, uh, letting them drive the process of inquiry? And why intensify their focus on a, on a portable device as an information source instead of developing their observational skills as naturalists with the device serving as a mere support? Like most experimenters in such domains, early experimenters at least, I've noticed with some dismay seeing how the adding of augmented reality or other device-based supplements are far worse than headphones, for instance, in a museum environment. Uh, so I think this question is a fundamental question. And such questions might seem secondary when uh, information, quality information is a primary focus, but urban parklands don't just tell one kind of story or provide just one point of engagement for visitor populations. Rather, they're cultural, social, and economic spaces that spill out into the city and the city spills back into them. And this is true not only of the flow of visitors day and night, on and off path, human and not, but also of the flora that makes them up. The intended landscape is constantly intruded upon by so-called invasive species, and invited species introduced into parks frequently migrate outwards to invade the urban landscape in ways, of course, that were unintended. And each and every plant is more than a botanical record. It comes from a place. It tells a story about its own extraction. Uh, it has physical properties. It has sometimes medicinal properties. Um, in short, this, there's a rich weaving together of stories here. So let's return to the question of how to build a proper bridge. An alternative approach, the one we've been at least experimenting with on the Digital Ecologies Project, might involve understanding the mobile device as the equivalent of a field notebook or sketchbook. In other words, as a kind of gathering or collecting device that rather than delivering information, supports operations of observation on the part of visitors in the spirit of its 19th century predecessors, such operations would include sample collection, field notes, the capture of sounds, the making of measurements, and taking of temperatures, and other procedures that use smart devices equipped with sensors. Carried on on site as a function of visitor interests, uh, these materials could then be processed, edited, crossbred with online resources and published post-visit in the form of curated itineraries that become part of a pre-visit library that's shared and that unfolds a multiplicity of ways of engaging with uh, landscape. And this, uh, of course, has built into it the prospect of citizen science and other kinds of forms of participatory engagement that would actually produce knowledge, not just share curated knowledge, so to speak. In these remarks, I've tried to survey some of the ways in which such caretaking of our cultural present, this caretaking that takes us back really to the etymological sense of curation as t the taking care, especially for that which is endangered and unable to care for itself, how this caretaking of the cultural present and past is evolving in scale and scope, 
shuttling back and forth between familiar and unfamiliar realms, creating new audiences and possibilities as well as forming new challenges and problems, eroding some disciplinary boundaries and forging new ones. Amid such shifts, there's a deeper question. In a world that is ever increasingly being transformed into an open-air classroom, laboratory, library, archive, and museum, what is the location of institutions of higher learning? From the standpoint of what I've been referring to here as knowledge design, the most compelling answer to the question can be summed up in a single word. Thank you. <laughs>